Welcome to The Non-Writer, where I tell stories from the avant-garde. If you like these stories, please subscribe to The Non-Writer on Substack. You'll find the link in the description. Not all my stories make it to YouTube, so if you don't want to miss any, please subscribe over at Substack. That's the best way to support my writing and videos. And it's free! You can also like and subscribe here on YouTube, and that'll help others who might like these stories find them. And if you're already subscribing, thanks a lot. I appreciate your support. Today's story is about a band of brothers that made music together for 50 years. I'm talking about the Washington, D.C. based band, The Muffins, who recently released a box set covering that 50 years of history called Baker's Dozen. And we're going to be talking about that in this video, where you're going to get to hear from this guy. That's Paul's fault. I blame <laughs> that on Paul. And this guy. Take the helm, bro. And of course, this guy. I saw every motherfucking second of that motherfucking <laughs> festival. And this is only part one of the story. I'm still working on part two, so look for that in the near future. So sit back and enjoy the story about the muffins. Baker's does it. My whole interest in avant-garde, rock, progressive, blah, blah, blah really goes back to to the muffins i met them when i was 15. the the idea for the box set came from the band i mean it came from paul paul was talking about it and, and he was pushing the idea and I, paul's a pretty good archivist he had a pretty good collection of tapes and cassettes and, and that sort of things. I've been mulling the idea over for years. I had uh, uh, been digitizing uh, since I acquired a DAW, uh, since I built the DAW actually, um, I'd been digitizing all the reels and cassettes of, uh, of stuff that we had lying around you know, before the tapes, uh, you know, deteriorated to the point of no return and ended up uh, with a, a shelf with probably 70 or 70 or 80 CDs worth of music on it. Who were those muffins? That, the, those muffins at the time was Dave Newhouse on keyboards and woodwinds and percussion. Uh, Tom Scott, primarily on woodwinds, uh, later also on keyboards, and uh, Billy Swan, who played uh, bass and guitar. Paul's idea of the box set, kind of, everybody liked the idea. It sounded good. Um, what didn't sound good was the tapes, well, not the tapes, the, the CDs that he was sending out. These were things we had done in performance. These were things that we would try out in the practice room just to see, you know, is this worthwhile taking to uh, a performance um, or does it sound like crap? So we recorded all of it so that after rehearsal, we listened to it or we would listen to new songs and see which ones needed serious work or which ones were worthwhile or, or, or good as they were. So anyway, here we have this massive collection of tapes and as I said before, Paul had a great collection of it. He just collected masters and tapes. You know, he loved to do that. So good thing. It means we had a lot of this stuff available. Interestingly enough, this is not some this project does not come solely out of Paul's archive. It comes out of a large collection from a lot of sources and a lot of outreach. Maybe we'll just do this ourselves. And so we started to send music back and forth and uh, it was going very slowly. And we were basically not always in agreement as to what this thing should be. And uh, we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for Christ, a couple of years, you know, and uh, uh, Dave had actually put together a few discs, but not everybody agreed on them. And uh, I always have been, talking to Feigenbaum. I mean, I, I talked to Steve on a fairly regular basis, a couple times a month at least. 
you know, I think there were some attempts made by various members of the band to like, oh, should we have this? Should we have this? Should we have this? Should we have this? And you, I, I think it was like, it was a lot of cooks in the kitchen and it required maybe more commitment in terms of going over that stuff than some of the musicians wanted to deal with. And Steve said, let me try this. And so he did a, a, a small amount. And now things were starting to be level balanced and um, they weren't produced yet. They weren't compressed and, and, and stitched together, but they were starting to sound reasonable. So it's like, okay, this, this has been the case in the past. Steve is our, our better uh, selector archivist kind of personality. And he did us a great service by taking it on at great expense to his personal time and, and funds. And so we were just hoping that Steve could handle this really massive task and do a good job at it. And he really has. I mean, it was not an easy task. Well, I just approached it by suggesting to these guys that we do something like that. And they all kind of went, oh, yeah, yeah, it might be a good idea someday. You know, who's going to actually do it? And it's a lot of work and yada, 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 yada. And, uh, and you know, like after a couple of years of uh, pooting around with it back and forth, you know, Steve got a whiff of it either from probably Dave or I. And uh, he... Uh, he stepped up to the plate and offered to take this entire project under his wing, which we were unanimous in agreeing to just hand Steve the, you know, it, take the helm, bro. I've known them a long time, at, you know, on a personal, friendly basis. And at one point, one of the guys in the bands was expressing frustration that, you know, well, I keep putting these you know, CDs together and some of the other guys don't want to listen to it, whatever. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you like, I could try to put together something. And it has the advantage that I know everybody and I'm going to, I'm not going to get everybody's, try to get everybody's approval on each and everything I'm going to put together a disc. I'm going to run it by everybody. And if they like it, great, you know. And if they don't like it, well, I'm going to probably bow out because this is more than I can handle and blah, blah, blah. At a certain point, I put together two records. What I thought were two, you know, this is probably how I will start the box. And, you know, of course, I'm making it up as I go along. I don't, I mean, I have an idea and the more I worked on it, the more I developed an overall plan, but, you know, I was kind of like, at first it's just like, well, I'm going to do this and see what everybody thinks. Cause, cause, you know, I don't want to spend too much money on this um, because what if they hate it? And that's the end of that. So at a certain point, everybody said, Steve, you did a good job. And, you know, if you can keep doing it like this, we're very happy to have you do it. So it's called Baker's Dozen because it's 12 CDs and one DVD. Yes, that was not my original title. I started working on it. I was calling it, you know, when I was using it as, as a working title, I was calling it Boxed and Crossed. It's one of our tunes. Steve, since we gave him, you know, complete license for this he wanted to call it baker's dozen and i just said okay it's baker's dozen <laughs> i mean the title came much later the title did not come i wasn't worrying about what we were going to call it. there were names being thrown around and i basically said uh, leave me alone i'm not committing to any of your names i'm not <laughs> interested we'll talk about this later let me work on this here, here's the pretty box. Nice and picture of Dave on baritone, Dave Newhouse on baritone sax, Billy Swan playing, playing his Zoom bass, and then we've got uh, Tom Scott on sax and Paul Sears on drums. And then what what I came up with is 
So, it, you know, and again, I came up with the packaging after I knew what the what the music would be. Um, there are eight discs from the original era, and there are two digipacks of four discs. And there they are. La, 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 yeah, show la. us that. Show us that. Yeah, the, the tape looks great. Is that? Well, the, oh, well, so yeah. So the thing is, is the designer who, who is a, a man named Eric Kearns. And I had worked with Eric before. He's a friend of Dave's. Um, but, you know, as we were working on this, um, you know, uh, actually, Ian, Ian Bebout, who uh, was the engineer, and I, I worked very closely with Ian. I didn't, I mean, I didn't work really closely with Eric just because I saw things and I'm not a visual artist and I'm not, you know, and, and I'm not a control freak. So it was like, yeah, it looks, you know, does everybody else like it? I'm fine with it. It's fine. You know, that's, that's, that's how you survive. Um, but Ian was taking pictures of all the reels. And so, you know, for the disc faces, Eric had the wonderful idea to, to, to use photos of the reels that you know that we were using to create this set because much much of the stuff not all of it but much of the stuff uh from the original era is on real to real real to real tapes none of the stuff from the second era is on real to real tapes this is the outside and and this is an inside and you can see that the four discs each looked like a roll of tape, which was such a fantastic idea because they photographed a lot of our older uh, masters and then turned them into the artwork on the CD. And some of them, you can see their masters. I mean, this obviously is side one and side two because you see the huge amount of leader tape. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the thing that lets the mastering engineer know to stop uh, cutting the um, acetate and, you know, prepare for cutting the next side. And there's the uh, discs. Uh, there's, there's discs five through eight, very well done. Eric Kearns did a wonderful job uh, with the graphics and uh, Ian, Ian about uh, did a, a great job with uh, remastering all this stuff. I'm sure it was a, uh, a uh took them a while so to speak and then there's the uh discs discs nine through twelve very nicely done yeah they did uh eric did a bang up job on this and uh then we have the totally cool uh the uh near fast dvd which is That's nice we we've got the uh dvd and this is of the Nearfest performance and a bonus album, Palindrome, which is one of our better recorded and produced uh, pieces from the second half of our uh, existence. I, on the DVD, yeah, disc number 12 is the audio from Nearfest, Near and disc, uh, the DVD is the video with the audio from Nearfest, and, and included on there as a bonus because we wanted to get it out there. We had an album uh, called Palindrome, uh, which we put out on a French label a long time ago and uh, they didn't do it. Uh, they didn't really push it too much, but we liked it. And uh, you know, it, it, when I started this thing, I, I, I definitely wanted to make Palindrome part of the box somehow. So what Steve did, bless him, uh, was he uh, agreed to include Palindrome as an audio only bonus on the DVD. So I thought that's pretty cool. Uh, while all this is going on, Dave Newhouse is working like uh, uh, working like a slave putting together this giant booklet. Dave did this whole thing. He curated this entire whole mess with the uh, all the old pictures and storytelling and he had he would send questions around to all of us and say, uh, what do you guys remember about this? And we would, we would, you know, do that. And then, and then he would edit it and put it together and it ended up, it's, uh, it's like 
five pages of stuff. You know, it, it, it's a you know it's a publication on on its own. <laughs> right. Woo! <laughs> There's no yeah. way for me to show this off properly no. to your to your home audience. But yes, it's an 80 page booklet, and the booklet was put together mostly by Dave. He interviewed a bunch of people. He didn't want to do it. I hope he doesn't get too sad. I, I say this, but I think he's, he's okay with it. He didn't want to do it. And I basically said, look, Dave, I think the band needs to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to tell your story. I'm willing to, I'm, I, you know, I'm perfectly happy and feel qualified to, to, to choose music. But I don't want to tell your story. Your story should be told by somebody in the band. And since you're the English teacher or the language arts teacher, as they call it now, I think you're the guy. But he, 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 he wasn't happy. And then he got into it. He did. A, I think he did a wonderful job. I'm really happy with the book. So everybody is, a, is, is given their room to, to say what they need to say. Was I surprised? Yeah, well, in terms of the music, the recordings, I kind of knew. Right. Then the question was, what's the best sounding version of this we have? Nineteen seventy eight rolls around. And you get invited to play Giorgio Gomelsky's Zoo Mana Festival in New York. And Gomelsky had just moved to New York City uh, at the beginning of 1978. And so Gomelsky uh, gives you a call out of the blue? That's correct. Yeah, yeah that rattled my nerves, uh, Rick, because I'd known his name uh, since I was about 14. Right. And for people who don't know his name, Gomelsky became famous mostly in the mid mid 60s, working with uh, first the Rolling Stones. Yes. Uh, and then uh, longer with uh, the Yardbirds. That was always the mystery to me because I read everything on a record cover, everything. And uh, I could not. Get it that um, I would. I would discover a band like, um, well, the, the John McLaughlin's first album, Extrapolation, produced right. by Gomelsky, you know, and then, then later on I get into uh, Gong, right. and there's that name again, exactly. and Magnum, there's that name again, and right. I'm going, you know, who is this guy with this weird name that loves all the music that I do, I mean, he's following me or something, Right. and then, then he calls the house. <laughs> and, and you'd never spoken with him before. No. Uh, yeah, I get, uh, I, I answer the phone and I get, hello, this is George Ogomelsky. I am trying to reach the muffins. And I just, <laughs> I just about, I just about wet my pants. You know, I, I, I had to go back. I had to go to New Jersey anyway on other business. And uh, I said, I'll just tell you what, George, I'm going to be, you know, five stops from Penn Station, why don't I come talk to you? And he went, yeah, sure, come on, come up and stay with me. So, okay. So, uh, yeah, 10 block walk from Penn Station to where he lived. And uh, uh, what a what an evening, you know, I couldn't get enough of this guy. I was a, you know, goggle-eyed 25-year-old fanboy, you know? Right, right. <laughs> And yeah. he kept me up all freaking night. He made uh, he made rusty potatoes for dinner that night. I remember, and uh, we just stayed up all night drinking and shooting the shit. And he was telling me all these nutball stories about the Yardbirds touring with their own drinking water, you know, and uh, uh, Gong and Magna and the youth hostels in Europe and what he was trying to do here and yada yada. And then the next day, uh, I met. I met uh, Laswell and Fred Mayer and Michael Blindhorn right. and uh, Cliff Coltrary. And they were, they were just, they were 
you know, partying around in the basement and they were calling themselves the zoo band at that time. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I played with him for, for a, couple, a couple of days and, uh, you know, it was, it was fun. And, uh, Laswell was, Laswell was a great guy. He, he took me on the, my first and only trip on the New York Metro. We went, we went record shopping together, went out to lunch and all that kind of stuff. It was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. He was a good guy. So the Muffins end up playing, uh, the Zoo Mana Festival and the festival, um, is recorded by Giorgio and eventually you end up uh, getting a hold of this recording and, and putting it on the box set. Well, first of all, I've been dreaming about doing that for about 40 years. Paul had been working for years to try to get our work at the uh, Mana Festival from Giorgio and he just was not willing to release it. And, and when I say years, I, I don't mean he tried once and gave up. Uh, Paul would try and try. Every time he went up, he would visit with Giorgio and be having a great time. And they're talking about all this stuff that, that could be done. And then Paul would go, hey, how about the music? Can I get a copy of that? And it would be like, nah, that's it. You know, I, if I had that, you know, the stage recording, which I had heard, it wasn't all real good, but it was a lot more present than the audience boots that were out there. And I had always dreamed ever since I got a doll of taking the, the, the stage recording and a decent bootleg and combining them to make something that would be releasable. And it wasn't until right after Giorgio passed away, uh, David Soldier knew I had been after this stuff for a long time and uh, he rescued all of the Giorgio stuff. God knows what else he got, you know, but uh, he, uh, he um, rescued all that stuff, uh, had it, uh, had the tapes baked, I think, and then had it all digitized and whatever, and finally sent me the files. You would run into Giorgio from time to time and you would ask him, about this tape and he would always refuse you do you know why he 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 was would not give you the tape i have a feeling that he thought that uh that uh, that we would somehow monetize them and he wouldn't get any money that's what i thought uh-huh but what i had offered to do was to just you know can we just digitize this stuff before it rots you know and then i'll give you the damn things back you know, so we have them preserved. At least, you know, can I get my stuff? You know, you know, can I get our stuff? You know, and he just obstinately refused, refused, refused. And I had visited him on several occasions, talked to him on the phone, you know, email back and forth, and you know, and he just would not get. He just would not do it. But he didn't really explain himself at that time. And he never explained himself. He just didn't do anything. Yeah, I'd ask him about it, and he wouldn't respond. No. So, yeah, like you say, thanks to uh, Dave Soldier for rescuing those tapes. With the two short tunes that we played, I was able to to get what I thought was an acceptable sound. I, I was able to take a. Uh, horse bones and under Dolly's wing and uh, get them kind of matched up and sounding kind of okay. It's the worst sounding thing on the box. I, I actually didn't want it, but you know, it was one of the things that some people in the band felt really strongly about. It's three and a half minutes. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna blow up my 45 year old friendships with people because they want three and a half minutes that I don't want? No, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, you learn to roll with people, you roll with the punches, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, you know, that was not my decision. I'm not, you know, it's fine. It's on there. And, and uh, actually it's on there. And some people like you yes. are very excited about it. Exactly. And I love being able to hear that.
You have a great uh, quote, an extended quote from Fred Frith about the zoo festival. And it, it, it actually explains something that um, I've been asking for quite some time now. And that is, there's a wonderful f a poster of the zoo festival that has most of the bands listed on the Oh, program. right. And Fred's not listed. And Fred's not listed. And I always wondered, why is that? He was clearly one of the stars. Yes, you know, he's one of the perform. stars. But he didn't want to play there. And Giorgio kind of like yeah. stuck it to him. So he explains it in the quote in the booklet. And yes. I'm so happy to have that. Also, I believe it's the only recordings of the Zoo, zoo Fest that ever came out. It's, yeah, as, as a, an official release. As yes. an official release, yes. Yeah. The guys weren't really into that. And I had to really, at, at, I had to really, uh, uh, I had to really push to get that track on the disc, but I think it's great that it's there because it's cool and nobody else has ever published anything from that festival. Right. That is true. For the first. And I thought it was cool because audience response was fantastic because they'd been listening. They had been listening to the no wave bands all day. I was at the zoo festival. The thing that was very interesting about the Zoo Festival is it really was an avant-garde festival. And it was so avant-garde at a very volatile period of time. This is my take on it, okay? At a very volatile period of time that the fans, the, the main fans of the avant-garde actually didn't like a lot of what was being presented. Giorgio presented a huge amount of the no wave stuff. And I sat in the audience and watched every bit of it and didn't understand any of it. How is it that you didn't understand it? Well, it was a completely different aesthetic than what the muffins were and a completely different aesthetic than, than what I was used to. You know, I mean, I'm talking about I'm talking about, you know, I mean, I, you know, no wave is an interesting phenomenon and, and, you know, with some hindsight and some time, I, I understand what's going on and I like it, but at the time it just seemed so anti-music, which is, I, I think, exactly the point. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what they wanted to do. And so... And, and most of the audience was there to see Fred Frith and, 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 and Chris Cutler and, you know, and David Allen and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, what is all this noise? And so it was very, it was very, you know, and I, I you know, um, I, and it's kind of amazing that Giorgio had that because it wasn't a popular, I, I mean, maybe he didn't know it was going to be an unpopular decision. It was not a popular decision with most of the audience, okay? Right. But I watched it. I saw every one of those motherfucking bands, including- Yeah, I was going to say, wait, were you there for the entire 12 plus hours? I was, I saw every motherfucking second of that motherfucking <laughs> festival <laughs> and didn't like a lot. Right, yeah. And so, and neither did most of the audience. And so, you know, so basically you had an audience unhappily sitting through six hours of stuff that is the antithesis of what they like, even though it actually the most avant-garde stuff at the festival sure. it was very it was very very interesting anyway the muffins when the muffins played they were the first avant-garde band in the style of avant-garde bands that the people at that festival were there for like henry cow and gong and Hatfield the North and National Health and all that shit. So they were extremely well received. Mm -hmm.
you know. But I mean, you know, it's really the zoo festival is very interesting. I mean, it's like I really wish I could. I mean, maybe I'd see it. I mean, the thing is, at the time, you know, ninety. It's nineteen seventy eight, right? Right. You know, there. I mean, the everything. Everything that had to do with progressive rock in any way, even the cra- even the crazy shit, it was like getting swept away. It's like this is this is old and bad, you know. And so it was a it was a really, I you know I, I wish I could see some of that stuff now and see maybe I still wouldn't like it, but at least I'd understand the context. But at the time, it was just like, I, like, what the fuck? I never heard of these bands. I never heard of this idea of non-music. You know, huh? You know, um, I, it was outside of anything I'd ever experienced. It was, it was interesting. You know, I mean, well, you know, in 19, I mean, sorry, in 2022, you know, talking to you on November 30th, it's interesting. At the time, it was sure. like, I don't, I, I, I watched it all. <laughs> I mean, I'll give myself credit. I watched every fucking second of it. Right. And now it has this historical significance. It has gigantic very, historical for the very significance. Things, yes, for the very reasons uh, you're talking about here, because because it was so unusual. And it also was kind it of... It was very problem. early. It was very, very early, early yeah. the showcase of No Way. Right, you know, and it was for this, and it was six, trend. six hours of no wave bands. Yes, really, wow. And, and so it's at this time where you get this kind of branching off from what you were talking about, the what was known as Prague music, and it kind of branches away and becomes more avant garde. Yeah, what we're kind yes. of today calling avant Prague, yes. or funny music, or or right. whatever. But, and, and but it, that's when but that it, really starts bit, happening. That's pretty, when the downtown scene starts happening in New York. Yes, and it's a pretty different aesthetic. Yes, very much so. And especially in 78, I think it's a very raw, different aesthetic. Right, right. So yeah, anyway, it was you know, quite punk. Yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, it was just sort of like, it was a really, I remember it very, I don't remember the music very well, but right. I remember the event and it's very interesting to look at it. And it's very interesting, like the Giorgio, you know, he invited these people. I, did he right. think that they would be liked? Did he invite them because they'd be liked? Did he invite them because he thought they wouldn't be liked? Did he invite them because he could get them all for free? I don't know. So after, you know, listening to eight hours of this stuff, you got Robal and then the Muffins and then... Yashko Seffer and uh, Fred Frith, Blackvad and Billy, and Chris Cutler, and then um, uh, the the Gong stuff, you know. And it should we should also mention here that uh, um, not only were you playing with the Muffins at the Zoo Mana Festival, but you were also doing the live sound for the entire festival. Pretty much, except for when I was playing. That's very true. Um, if you look on the poster, you'll see a name, uh, Joe Goldman, on the zoo poster. That was the guy that was supposed to be doing the sound. And for whatever reason, that ain't happening. And uh, Gilmelski called me up a week, about a week and a half before the uh, festival and said, and told me basically, Paul, there's a problem. And you can help. You can do the sound. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, you know, I knew what a mixer was. I'd had some experience with big sound systems. So I said, okay, whatever. You know, and uh, a couple days before the festival, Fred Frith has arrived. I go in the house and Giorgio says, you know, go and go in the next room and have some wine. I go in the next room and have some wine. Who's pouring the wine? Debbie Harry and Robert Fripp. <laughs> <laughs> and you would see them again at the festival. Oh, yeah. They can't go. They sat right in front of me for uh, hours. Uh, the 
zoo festival was insanity. It was just out of control. So yeah, there were a lot of people there that um, Paul at some point in time introduced me to um, what Debbie Harry and uh, Robert Fripp. <laughs> yeah, Robert Fripp, and it was like we, he was like Tom, look, <laughs> and it was like just our horn player, and I was like how did you find them? He said, no, no. Giorgio introduced us. It's like, oh, okay. I heard Chris Stein was there too, but I didn't, I never met him. Uh -huh. But um, I, I remember saying the, saying the Robert Fripp, I said, I said, I verbatim, I said, you're the last guy I expected to run into here. <laughs> and then he told me he was visiting New York to you know, check stuff out. He was hanging out with Debbie Harry and she was, uh, uh, Wonderful, very polite, friendly, talkative, you know, very, very cool. Well, Zoo, first of all, none of these people had ever played there before. Nobody gave me a piece of paper with a line list on it saying, by the way, this is where the microphones are going to be going. And this is going to be plugged into that and, and so on. None of that. I can remember being really concerned about that because I felt like, geez, if Paul has to go through these hours and hours of this craziness, because he would take off from the console and run out and back and around in order to get information. They didn't have any walkie-talkie communication. And I can remember thinking to myself, geez, this is going to run him ragged. And I was concerned that by the time we are ready to play, Paul will be a frazzle. But Paul was and is, well, was a real <laughs> high energy guy. He could yeah. do that kind of thing all day long. It was not right. a problem. Um, so that worry was over nothing. Paul was rock solid. Anytime the place filled up immediately. And to get to the stage, it made more sense for me to go out the front door, run around the back of the building, and go in the loading dock. <laughs> and then get to the backstage that way, and then with a pad of paper, and start asking questions. Okay, who's doing what back here? I, I, I need it written down so that I have a clue what's going on. You know, there was no, you know, Nextel or headset communication or anything with from the front mixer to the stage. Right. So, so those first few bands that played probably suffered some from the. Uh, lack of uh, no sound checks, obviously. Sound check. There was not, not nobody got a sound check. Yeah. Yeah. If you did, it was 15 seconds. Okay. Can we hear everything? Okay. Let's go. You know, <laughs> the, schedule, the schedules were so tight. When we played the Zoo Fest, we got a real warm and fuzzy reception from. Uh, Giorgio Gromelski. I mean, he was really, he had great plans for us and, and he presented them to the band and, and I can't speak for the rest of the guys in the band. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of those guys were ready to pick up and go. I talked to Giorgio. Um, he came to the muffin house and my then girlfriend and I, this was post zoo. My then girlfriend and I, uh, uh, she lived in the house, um, uh, heard some of his talk. Um, you probably want to turn the camera off now because it's like, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't impressed. And there's a great quote from Tom Scott about yeah. Giorgio. But I didn't get a warm, fuzzy feeling from Giorgio. Um, my bullshit meter just went off the rails. It just did not. He came down. He made some sort of a presentation like you guys should go to Europe. You're so great. Blah, 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 blah. You'll find your audience there. And he made a big pot of chili. And my girlfriend and I did all the dishes. And so I had told the guys, we are not um, headed to Europe and going to do this and let me say this about that the the muffins were not i did not lead and direct the muffins however a lot of times i was the voice of reason or the person that 
put a stop to an idea that I thought would possibly be destructive of our own financial well-being. So I kind of became the chief chief financial officer of us. And when ideas came out that looked bad, I would go, "Mm, I don't think we should do this. So as that year would unfold for the Muffins, you guys would start working on another album and eventually you would hire Fred Frith to produce it. And that would be your first time working with an outside producer. You know, after we got through, after, after we got through Gravity, you know, a couple of years later, you know, he, uh, he called the house and uh, we were talking and he said, you know, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to work with you guys on the, on the next record. So that became uh, 185. And so 185 is also a random radar release. That's correct. But it would get reissued on Cuneiform later. Yes, much later. Um, Steve, I was I was always hoping he would do that because that was always my favorite recording. Was then, is now, and will be tomorrow my favorite Muffins recording. Uh, but Steve, Steve and some other people that were close to the band uh, didn't, they weren't, uh, you know, 100% warm and fuzzy with Fred's production stuff. Uh which I happen to love, you know, I mean, the 185, if you listen to the the two versions of it that were on the CD, they are, they are radically different. And I happen to prefer the original Fred Frith mix, you know, okay, that's the one I love because he worked his ass off on that. And, and, and only he was under a lot of pressure. We didn't have a lot of time and he, and he pulled off some amazing stuff. I thought. So after you guys record 185, pretty soon the band is going to collapse. And it seems like you've just released 185. It should be a motivating time for the band. But we were hoping we were hoping that that would do more than it did. You know, the album wasn't received as well as you had hoped. And correct. This kind of demoralized the band. Well, that too. And, uh, you know, they were, um, Tom, uh, Tom Scott was getting ready to start a family. You know, he'd already moved out of the house and, and bought another place nearby. Um, and, uh, the band didn't, you know, there was no, you know, big calamity, you know, it just, uh, it just sort of, it stopped. It's sort of like, like it paused for a few years. So 185 gets released. Do you tour it much? No. Um, It was pretty poorly received. We were, we hit that angular RIO sound just about the time that punk came along. And it was antithetical to what the muffins were doing. In fact, at that point in time, I was um, running a recording studio in my house in Rockville. And I was recording a lot of punk. I wasn't a big fan of punk, but I was good at recording and, and mixing it and producing it. Because um, punk was kind of the thing that terminated what we were doing. And, and that's giving punk too much power. What really terminated what we were doing is I was listening to the album and not liking what we'd done. And so I felt like I don't want to do this anymore. And so I quit. If it's not fun, I won't do it. And it did stop being fun. We did work so hard to get, we were so, we went into the studio and just blistered through these songs. Sometime after the release of 185, you decide to leave. And what was the uh, reaction from the rest of the band? Well, you know, they were really good guys about it. When, you know, I told him, I said, I love you guys. And turn around to him and go, guys, I just don't, I'm not feeling it anymore. I got to go. I have a baby at home and I want to be there. I don't want to be here grinding through another album's worth of music. And they were like, okay. You're entering a phase of your life where your priorities are changing. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And 
yeah, it didn't seem the band didn't seem important anymore to me at that point in time. I just thought ah, I'm done. And and I think Billy went on to play what the Urban Verbs. So Billy kept on top of it pretty quickly. Um, I know that F Fred and David played together in Skeleton Crew for oh. a period. So there were good things happening, you know, that the associations made other things happen. Um, uh, the Urban Verms ended and so did Skeleton Crew, but uh, that was just, a, it was time. It was sure. time for us to be done. 185 is the last studio album of the first, or the first era of the most. Yes. And you were saying earlier that uh, the muffins were running out of steam at this point. I my perception is the muffins right. were running out, and right. it was really it was. I mean, I can find it somewhere. There's this really, really, really mean spirited review from either Melody Maker or New Music Express. It's not oh. just like. We don't like it. It's just like, it's just this very mean spirited review. And one of the things that I found um, when researching everything, there's this, let me see if I can find a better version to show folks. Anyway, there was an article, oh yeah, th this picture, these pictures. Uh -huh. that Those pictures were done for an article on, um, avant-garde or new music in washington dc for a local um uh you know arts paper and the photographer uh contacted you know whatever but he also he sent me a copy of the article and i i read i i mean and i was interviewed in the article uh and i say something that is sort of awful, but is also completely true, is that, you know, earlier, you know, er earlier in the, in, in Random Radar's career, earlier in the Muffin's career, we were always marginalized. It's just, you know, we're playing marginal music. We get that. We're, but now we're marginalized and mocked. Uh, and you know I said it at the time it's kind of ugly and that was exactly how I felt and at the time I think it's true I think things have opened up tremendously but at the time you know what we were doing was really mocked and so, yeah, we, we were running out of steam. It's hard. It's hard to do something when it's it's hard enough when you're being ignored. It's worse if you're being made fun of. The muffins kind of peter out in eighty one, eighty two. Yes, eighty one. Okay, and then. There will be a reforming of the band in the early '90s, but on the so on the box set, is there this gap between? Yeah, there's a, it's a long gap, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a long gap. Uh, we didn't play between 1981 and 19, I think '93. Over 10 years go by, and then uh, you guys decide to reform. How did that happen? That's Paul's fault. I blame <laughs> that on Paul. Paul's an eternal optimist. The, you will never meet anybody who isn't, is any more affable than Paul. <laughs> and he kind of just, well, he did some really smart moves. One is he did a lot of reading. In, in, in on the internet and he discovered that there was interest in us so he got back to us and blew some hot air up our shirts by going 
you wouldn't believe it, but there's a lot of people out there that thought the muffins were something special. You got to remember at the point w- when we ended, it wasn't of, I wasn't feeling like, oh, this great band, I feel terrible about breaking it up. I was like, oh, we've just gone too far with this. That's, I'm done. So Paul's going, man, people are out there that would appreciate us. And, and, and I think Steve had already done a thing where he was like, hey, would you guys just reunion for one song? And I think we did that song. Uh, she, he, he, she wears her dead mother's hat. Um, for oh, yeah, a sample. This, yeah, this is a, a cuneiform sampler, right? For uh, yeah. that Steve released. And you had some connection with the band Happy the Man on that sampler. They, I think they covered one of your songs. Yeah, they did Hobart Got Burned. <laughs> I think we did it better, but <laughs> <laughs> they did it. They did a fine job of it. Um, yeah, that that project just showed us that, well, we could get together and, and do something. What Paul talked us into doing was a party at his house. You know, just get, let's get together and play. And we did that. And it was real comfortable. And it was almost like we picked up right where we left off, which I thought was pretty impressive because a lot of us hadn't been playing that much recently. You know, they all were happened to be in the same town at the same time or they made sure that they were all... And so they got together just for fun, for friends to make some noise. And um, and I invited them if they wanted to uh, contribute a track to the cuneiform record artists play other cuneiform record artists uh, uh, sampler I was working on that they were welcome to, and they did. But at that time, I would not have guessed that they would do it again right but apparently that was the seed that got them back that that apparently was a seed more than that i really can't say apparently that was and i should also mention that uh on that album the people who who do a cover of the muffins is happy the man (laughs) yes you know they were they were the most successful washington dc progressive band Kit Watkins and Coco Rousseau from Happy the Men, they covered a muffin song. Right. We played Hobart Got Burned. I thought that was pretty cool. Pretty neat version. Pretty yeah. cool then to do that. So anyway, then, then the muffins go dark. But between, you know, 94 and 97, I'm living on the internet and I am running across a lot of information about the muffins on progressive, you know, alt rec, progressive, alt, alt, alt music, avant, whatever it was. There was good old, uh, uh, what was it back in those days? Alta Vista. That's what I was using all the time to go searching back in the early 90s. But I found on Alta Vista a, just a, hundreds of pages about the muffins. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is pretty neat, you know? So, you know, I, I shared this information with the boys and uh, gently prodded them uh, for the better part of a year. And then um, we decided, you know, the stars were the stars were all aligned and everybody said, OK, let's get together and we'll do a, a small reunion gig and see how that goes. Searching around for a place to play there, there was a whole lot of options, but uh, I ran into um, the guy a guy that, that used to book um, that used to book bands into a couple of different venues in uh, in Washington, and uh, he was running a place at the time that had a wide variety of music, and it was a little tiny place, held maybe eighty or ninety people, served uh, sandwiches and bar food, and, you know that sort of thing, and it was called Chief Ike's Mambo Room. I ran into the guy that ran that place, and I asked him, you know, I. I I said, you know, how would you, how would you, you know, uh, you know, the muffins are back together. And he went, yeah, I remember you guys. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. What are you doing? What's new? Blah, 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 blah. I said, well, I was thinking about doing it like a, you know, reunion show. And I was wondering about, you know, like, you know, like, could we do it maybe at Chief Ike's? And he like immediately said, he said, I'll, I'll tell you what, guys, I'll give you a Thursday night, your own Thursday night. You put your own person at the door, sell your own merchandise, provide your own security, keep all the money and make sure the bar, the bar people get, get a slice. He, he was really cool about it. I, I, I'm thankful. So he just, and he, 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 he held, he held his word. 
and we had a great little show and it was packed. And uh, so we were, we were all pumped up about that. And uh, we did another one the next year, which was in a bigger place and bigger packed. People flew over from Germany to see the muffins. Paul got us into the knitting factory. So Paul did a lot of work to promote the band and, and manage the band. And he did a really good job. He got us in there and people knew he was the contact. Bruce Galanter at the Downtown Music Gallery in New York, his name came up. So huh? I contacted him and he said to me, you guys should be at the Knitting Factory. The guy that runs the Knitting Factory is a huge fan of yours. His name is Glenn Max. And later on, he's, he, you can read about this. He was the guy that got Vander Graaff Generator to get back together. Uh-huh. Now, I wrote to Glenn Max, and, uh, and Glenn Max went, that's super. You guys are more than welcome to play here. And by the way, would you like to go to Italy and represent us at this big festival in Rome? Well, it sounds like a big deal for the band. I mean, have oh, they, it's a gigantic have, deal. Have like, they, they ever played in Europe? USA for the first time? They went. Yeah. I mean, you know, the furthest they had ever got. They look in their original lifetime. They played in Pennsylvania. They played in Ro Rhode Island. They played in Massachusetts. They played in D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. So, I mean, suddenly they're in Rome. I don't know if. I don't remember if both Knitting Factory gigs were recorded, but I think I think I used the second one and it, almost all of it's on the box. Great. <clears throat> and it's a it's a it's a pretty wild recording. It's you know, it's professional, but it's not that. But anyway, it, but it's it's a really spirited show. They really I mean, it's like they sound like they're having a blast and they're really kicking ass. There's a story that Dave tells of us driving up into New York during rush hour. And the whole time driving up there, Paul's like, hey, let me let me uh, drive. And I was like, OK, good going. And we'd be going along. And Paul creeped up on the back of somebody. And said, hey, Paul, this van's about a ton of equipment in it. And it's a half ton vehicle. And then there's all of us. So you got about two tons. You know, that's 4,000 pounds. You're not going to stop on a dime, buddy. Back off that car. And, you know, I have to tell him about the uh, half dozen times going up there. So we get up into New York. I'm like, all right, Paul, you need to let me drive now. So <laughs> we're getting off and, and filtering into New York and people just driving aggressive. They won't let you in. And this old van of mine, <laughs> look at the people that keep cutting me off. And I holler at them saying, I will hit you. Look at this van. I don't care. And I pull in and they all stop and let me go. <laughs> Dave was impressed because he, had, he hadn't seen that part of me before. <laughs> the angry driver. I will hit you. <laughs> yes, I will hit you. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> and, and, and then uh, you go to this festival in Rome. How was that for you? That was like a dream come true. That was amazing. I don't know how it was that we, somebody paid to bring us over there, keep us there for a while, and then uh, send us home. So in Rome, we showed up and we were walking around in Rome doing stuff and breakfast was paid for and, you know, dinner was paid for. And, and then a couple of days later, we do a performance. And heck, before you go on stage, somebody comes out and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars, here's your pay, one, two, three, four. I mean, it was an amazing experience and i saw other bands good well-known musicians that were flown in they played and flown out so we got treated so well to be there a week or i don't know maybe 10 days and we saw a lot of rome it was fantastic so what are the final few uh cuts that are on the box set what what period of time does that take us to well, the uh, the final few, well, the, the 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 final few concerts. I mean, geez, you know, we, it's uh, basically uh, uh, there's the the Orion stuff and uh, Nearfest. I can't count how many times we played at Orion. 
what Orion, uh, sort of like the knitting factory in that they have a built-in studio. I mean, all, all Mike, all the owner has to do is go turn the machines on and you get a, you know, multi-track recording of your gig. Oh, and there is some 2010 stuff from Prague Day that's at Orion, that's uh, at Prague Day. That's pretty cool. Ended up uh, headlining at in 2010. We played there three times. Uh huh. 2001, 2002, and 2010. So the box set ends pretty much around 2010. And then finally in 2015, there's an opportunity for the Muffins to play again, and it will turn out to be their very last performance. And it happens at actually a, a film showing of a documentary called Romantic Warriors. And uh, I, you can get the Romantic Warriors uh, documentaries on DVD, and I have them all. You can also you can also just like stream them for a fee on Amazon. Right. I think you don't want to buy a DVD. Do you sell them through Wayside? Yes. Okay. So order them through Wayside. I think it's worth having the discs. There's one on Progressive Rock. There's one on Canterbury. There's one on Rock in Opposition. And I think there's two so far on Kraut Rock, and there will be a third one. There's five, and then there are bonus ones that have, like, performance footage, not the documentary. Right, or interviews, because uh, one of them has a lengthy interview with Giorgio. Right. Um, and people like that. So the Romantic Warriors filmmakers come to D.C. to have a show. They live in D.C. Oh, they live in D.C. There we go. They live in D.C. <laughs> um, yeah, they're locals. So this turns out to be the last Muffins performance. It's not on the box set because it was made for them. Yeah, right, right. So if you want to hear it and see it, it's... You go, the, yeah, you should go look for uh, uh, the Romantic Warriors uh, uh, Canterbury. It would end up being your very last performance. And did you did you know it was going to be your last performance? Not really. No. Billy and Dave and Paul thought this was just our next performance. Um, I had, we were working, we were in mid project of um, a CD that was, had a couple different working names. I'm not remembering them right now, but they were, yeah, we were midway through it. And um, I had gotten, a letter from Dave because I had told Dave as we were going along, Dave, this is a, you know, this is something we've talked about for decades. We're doing a big ba band album and you're doing little quartet songs for a big band album. What's, what's going on with that? And he's like, ah, just not hearing the other stuff in his letter. He goes, um, I'm going to release my songs as a solo album and you need to release yours as a solo album. And, then we'll go on to the next muffin thing. And I read through the letter and somewhere in the letter, he had said something like, yeah, maybe you don't want to play with me anymore after reading this. I don't know, but just give it time. I was like, yeah, I don't want to play with you anymore. So let's give it time. Well, time didn't heal that wound. He made a unilateral decision and it broke the brotherhood. So. I had a decision at that point in time. It was to go to Dave and say, uh, if that's what you want, we're done. But that's me forcing the hand of my best friend or one of my best friends. And that's a shitty way. That's no friend, right? So I just went, damn, I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't. It's, it's done. My wife and I went into that performance knowing that it was the last muffin performance and we made the day golden. We enjoyed the rehearsal time. And then we went out to lunch at a place called um, Bonfire, which is uh, kind of like a Texas barbecue house up in Maryland. And then we went back and did the performance and, and it was a really nice performance. And I knew it was the last, but because it was a release party for the um, DVD. I didn't breathe a word about it because I thought it would be really crappy of me to rain on that parade. Those people were taking the time to put the, this release party together. I can hold my tongue. 
And so I did. In fact, I didn't say anything to anybody for the longest time. The people that make those Romantic Warriors movies are, are good friends of ours, Jose and, uh, and Adele. They really wanted the muffins. To, they really wanted to film the muffins. And uh, all the, the, the muffins all lived within driving distance. They flew me out from Arizona specifically to do that show. And in fact, I stayed with Feigenbaum. I stayed with uh, Steve. So 2015 was the uh, end for the muffins. From 1973 or four to 2015, they did a lot of music. They did a lot. Of, they did a lot of music, and they did a lot of music with very little attention being right. paid. You know, but not only that, they formed this unique bond that I think only musicians who play together and live in a house together and share so much together can can possibly have. And you were a, a part of that bond. Yeah. And they to this to this day, they refer to each other as brothers. Yes. I mean, they're all, you know. They're, they're pretty close. I don't think any of us had actual brothers. David's a only child. Paul had a sister. I don't think Billy had brothers. I didn't have brothers. I had sisters. So none of us knew what it was like to have a brother. Uh, those guys are the brothers I never had, and I'm still friends with uh, all of them, you know. Right. Yeah, we're still, I, I love those guys. And for, for me, the doors always always open. Uh, right. I don't shut doors. The, the big thing that was there for uh, Dave, Billy, and I, and then eventually Paul, was that when we weren't happy with the result, it didn't interfere with the way we felt about each other as people. I mean, you know, nobody's ever 100% happy with everything, right? That's just not real. But we were happy with each other and we always cared enough, enough about each other to make sure that the decisions we made kept everybody as comfortable as possible, which meant we hardly ever put our foot down. Everybody has to put their foot down sometimes and say, I will not do that. But we held that. That wasn't the way we dealt with each other. It was the way we said, I can't go past that point. Most of the times what we did was compromise. And it really, you know, that's why I think we felt so brotherly, because we'd rather compromise and keep the relationship strong than to stress it. Because let's admit it, in this world that we live in, where everything is videoed or filmed, every band breaks up for the same reason. They stop dealing with each other like human beings and start getting all bossy and dad like you know i mean you know it's like we're all we're all pretty good friends i mean it doesn't you know that that doesn't necessarily mean we all want to live in the big hippie house together again no but, but <laughs> no i mean everybody loves everybody you know that doesn't you know it's like like as i said in the very beginning when we started talking rick you know and if you reach a problem in terms of oh you know we can't really we want to do this box but we really can't do it well do you want me to try? I could try. How did the how did the creating of this box set affect the band of brothers? I think it kind of helped put a bomb on the wound of the band ended because the band ended. <laughs> but in the ending, we got to the place where well, now that we can have a box set, you know, now that we're truly done. And we are, we can have a box set. And it turned out to be a really decent box set. When I listen to the box set, what blows me away about it is the 50 year, all the music that happened, how different it was. And, and it wasn't that it constantly got more intense and ended up at its, it got more intense. It was like waves on an ocean, you know, it, it, it was really fun to listen to and and a 
trip down memory lane for me, of course, because you hear some of these things that you haven't heard in 30 or 40 years for the older discs. And it's like, wow, that tune was, that was excellent. That was nice. I wish we'd recorded that on an album. <laughs> well, now we have. I think where everybody's stunned that it happened. I mean, I mean, you know, sometimes I just, I put this next to my bed and I pet it, you know, because <laughs> I, I, I can't believe it happened, you know. I can't believe that it went from, uh, you know, sort of, a, you know, casual, hey, guys, why don't we, why don't we do something with this ridiculously large archive that we have? You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have occurred without Steve and Steve and, you know, with our, our connections in, in the business, we have some very good people. I think uh, Eric Kearns did a wonderful job on the graphics. Uh, uh, Ian B about who's, who's still a bit of a youngster, but he did a great job on the mastering for everything. And, uh, uh, gosh, I'm just, I'm just, Pleased with the whole thing. It just pleases punch. I'm just, I'm still in, in I'm still like in, in amaze mode, you know, that this thing even happened. We all, and even more them, more than me, they did a lot together. I, I, I feel very certain that all of them think of the time in the band as a really special time. Not only can people hear this great music that the Muffins did through a range of styles over their time together, right? Um, but you will you will also hear the history of the music at that time. You'll read about the history of the music in the booklet, and you get this great story of this band of brothers who went through all of the, all of this extended period of time together and continued to uh, make music together. Yes, for a very long time. And for a very long time with it having to do about the music and not about getting paid for it. You know, exactly. very long. And it's very, I think it's very impressive, you know, and, and, and I'm really, you know, I'm really proud that I was able to do this. I'm really happy with it. I think it stands up really well, you know, as a musical document of, and I also think because I was able to show certain aspects of them that were not shown on their two albums at the time, I think it shows that their stylistic range was far greater than anybody had any idea. I got, when, when I was sent, when the box came out, I sent it out to people uh, in one week, and this is, I don't know if you've ever worked retail, but, you know, people don't generally write to you because they're happy. They write to you because there's a problem. You know, one week, or just three or four weeks ago, I got three letters in the same week from people who bought the box and really liked it and all had really nice things to say. But one person said, I would never have imagined that those couple of albums were just the tip of this enormous musical iceberg. And that really kind of sums it up. It's like all these things were here. And finally, you know, well, you know, you can look at two ways. Finally, everyone who's interested can enjoy it. Or finally, I got those fucking tapes out of my attic. 